Hello, I'm Chancellor Emeritus James Wieser. Since UNC entered its third century in the 1990s, no one has been more quietly influential in transforming the academic lives of students at our great university than our guest today, Pat Pukila, Emerita Professor of Biology. Pat retired from teaching in 2013, but in the previous two decades, she was the tireless leader of a movement on the UNC campus called Inquiry-Based Learning, and she was the founding director of UNC's Office for Undergraduate Research. Before Pat came on the scene, research was something that graduate students did, or perhaps a few honor students, largely because of the effort of Pat and her colleagues more than 27,000 students in recent years have had the opportunity to engage in inquiry-based learning, and many of these have conducted independent research projects. Her work has helped Carolina be a leader in providing advanced opportunities for inquiry-based learning for, for our undergraduates, and this in turn has helped UNC recruit the very best students, encouraged innovative teaching, and has provided hundreds of graduate students valuable experience in the process of designing and mentoring undergraduate research. So welcome to this conversation, Pat. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to really talk about this really transformative change in, the, in, in our undergraduate uh, education here at Chapel Hill. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be a part of this fascinating series that you and David Keel have put together. Well, it is, it is fascinating because we're talking, we get to talk to people who've really have and who are, are making a difference in making this the great university that it is. Thank you. So I recall a few years ago, uh, the Arts and Sciences magazine did a wonderful retrospective on you and this development. And in this, in this article, you told the story of your experience as a graduate student yourself years ago uh, and how this really ch changed the course of your life. Would you just repeat that story? Indeed. So in 1979, I'd actually finished my PhD. I was doing postdoctoral mm -hmm. studies, and I had been working for months on <laughs> a very tedious set of experiments. And it was a day when I knew that tomorrow would be what we call the moment of truth. Either I was on the right track, or I had wasted a lot of time. So I went home, typical evening, I assume. And then I came wide awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I said to my husband, honey, I have to go into the lab. And he said, now? <laughs> I said, yes, because the bacteria will have grown enough. I I'll know the answer now. I can't wait. He said, well, OK, but be careful. And so I drove down the dark streets of Cambridge and got to Harvard's bio labs, and it was booming. I mean, the lights on everywhere, people working. There's always right. someone in the right. bio labs. Went into the elevator. It's the ancient kind where you have to close the cage, right, and then right. you go up in the cage and you walked around to a room uh, which was at a constant temperature so that bacteria can grow. Um, that actually about the size of this room. I mean, gigantic space. Walked in. I can still remember exactly where my plates were. Walked up, held one, held the comparison. Oh, that looks good. The next pair, the next pair, the next pair. I understand something very important for the first time. I am the only person who knows that this mechanism is true. I've just proven this to myself, and that means I'm going to prove it to the world. There is nothing that matches the thrill of discovery. Mm -hmm. And so it was your remembrance of that wonderful moment. And, and what did you say to yourself? that? Uh, other, other under, undergraduates ought to have the benefit of that kind of experience, not just read about it, but actually experience well, it. Well, exactly. So lots of things needed to happen. Um, the first thing that needed to happen was they needed to get a job, which fortunately Carolina uh, said yes. But did you start already thinking as, as, a, as a postdoc about applying this? And this, maybe yes, maybe no. There was a lot going on in my life right then. I'm, right, right, I'm not right. really sure, but it certainly was a source of inspiration. Right. You know, pretty soon thereafter. So, got to campus, and my husband is a pediatrician, and mm -hmm. he got a fellowship at Duke, which quickly turned into a faculty position. Our son was enrolled in on-campus daycare, which we had then, <laughs> which was huge for all of this. I got my first grant from the National Institutes of Health, so everything looked great. 
But honestly, James, I w was realizing that my experiences were not really matching my expectations. And what years were these when you were this first This is 79, 80, 81, okay. in, in the early 80s. I had thought I would be joining an intellectual community. And instead, there were these firewalls everywhere, separating departments from each other, separating graduate education from undergraduate education. But most importantly, to your earlier point, separating undergraduates from everything that was really good about the campus, the right. chances for investigation, the chances for discovery. I was being asked in my classes to essentially be a talking textbook. What a waste of time. I, it just didn't, didn't really make any sense to me. So I quickly changed what I was doing in the classroom mm -hmm. to focus on what I thought was really important, that students would understand that scientific conclusions come from research. So their job is to learn how to decide if they have enough information to draw a conclusion. So here you are, an untenured assistant professor untenured in assistant biological professor sciences. And, and just doing what I thought right, was, right. was really important. So I was supported by, and I wasn't the only person in the world, certainly with these ideas. Um, so there's a, a book review that was influential to me at the time, Alison Gopnik. Um, and what she basically said was, it might be useful to imagine what it would look like if we tried to teach baseball the way we teach science. Right. So elementary school children would learn the history, they'd be inspired by the biographies of the great players. When they got to high school, they would be allowed to learn fundamentals, you know, throwing and catching and running and those things. And as undergraduates, they they might even be allowed to reproduce some famous plays of the past. <laughs> and if they got to graduate school, then they would be allowed to play a game. So right. obviously this isn't really going to work. I was also really influenced by writings of Parker Palmer, mm -hmm. who really encouraged faculty to think about what inspired them, what, tr what do they trust, what do they think, where is truth? So yeah, so if truth is authority, then your classroom is going to look like a dictatorship. You're the one who has the information, you're conveying it to them, and that's that. But that's pretty unsatisfactory for the long term, even for the medium term. I mean, what happens when you're no longer there to provide the answers, number right. one? And number two, what happens if students in the future encounter two authorities who disagree with each other? They don't have a way to draw, to know if they have enough information to draw a conclusion. What are they going to do? Right. So he goes on, but the one that I really like is to say, if you think that truth comes from inquiry, then your classrooms can look like communities. And of course, community was what I was so hungry for right, right from the get-go. And so this, this was very satisfying. Pat, before we go further, would you talk to us a bit about your own life as a scientist and the research that you do? With pleasure. Science is wonderful. Uh, I've already alluded to that set of experiments that, that I saw the results at 3 o'clock in the morning. And they proved to be paradigm shifting. They, they uh, proved that bacteria actually keep track of the strands. So it's important to know that DNA is the genetic material and remember that it's two strands. The sculpture in your neighborhood, the right. two strands that twirl along. So when it's copied, you separate the two strands and they each serve as a template, we say, for the new strand to be laid down. If a mistake is made where base pairs are now mismatched, how's a cell going to know what's right and what's wrong? And the idea was, well, if they could keep track of which the old strand was, that's got to have the correct information because the replication just made a mistake. And that's what my experiment showed the mechanism for, okay. which was amazing. As a, a PhD student, I developed a method for detecting a process in cells. It's actually still used as a diagnostic tool today. Greatly improved method, mind you, but when you're the first person to show that a process is going to work, that's just amazing. And in my own lab, I wanted to tackle the most interesting problem I could imagine. And that, to me, was how is it possible that organisms like us, who have two parents, are able to make gametes, eggs or sperm, with exactly half of the genetic material that we have in all of our cells. Who's in there directing traffic, saying, oh no, we already have one of you, now we need one of you. I mean, this is incredibly beautiful. And we're already privileged to understand the nature of genetics and how it works and the code and all of that. But this process of making a gamete is still eludes us. Mm. So I developed a model system, a mushroom actually, because it was really synchronous, uh, does this in a really synchronous way and has lots of experimental advantages. And we've 
really come so close. We've narrowed down on the chromosomes where this is happening. We have ideas that we know about the components that are in place. I don't quite have the one sentence description of, I know this is true, this is the way it works, yeah. but I'm close. You're close to that 3 a.m. I am. In, I am. The, the moment morning of truth, I'll write to you. <laughs> Good. All right. And then a little bit about your own education and the experience you had as an undergraduate, which may have informed what you were able to accomplish here at UNC. I had a fabulous experience as an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is essentially Chapel Hill with lakes right. and snow, but still very, very similar. Um, I had recounted the story of changing my major, so now here I am in molecular biology and I've got catching up to do, and so I enroll in a chemistry course that will combine two semesters into one, but I need another science class. And it was either going to be botany or zoology. And botany, I ruled out. And botany, who would study botany? I mean, undergrads make really wrong decisions a lot of the time. This left zoology, and most of the courses on that list were ruled out too, because I'm a pretty squeamish person, and these mm -hmm. were all going to involve something I didn't want to do. But there was this developmental biology, and I thought, that could, I really liked that in high school. I'll, I'll do that. And so I went along, advanced class, sat way in the back, lots of graduate students in it, and the faculty member, this is in the days of mimeograph, right? So he had typed right. out original work, and th this was our material for the course. And it was all about experimental design. It's all about, this is the idea of how this aspect of development works. Here's the prediction of that idea. Here's the experiment you could do. What would be the interpretation? It was amazing. I filled legal tablets with arguments to myself. Well, if this is true, what about that? What about this? Which proved to be perfect preparation for his exam, which was you had to buy blue books, you had to go to a room at night so we would have enough time. There were only two questions on the exam. I filled these blue books with all of the thinking I had been doing over the last several weeks. And it took him, oh gosh, five weeks to return them. And I'm sort of mildly curious as to what he thought of all of this. And on mine, I still have it. Mm. Please come and see me, he wrote on the cover mm. of my exam. And I went and saw him. He said, you need to do research. I'm like, research? What's that? So he got me into a lab of a colleague because there was no program for this or anything. And I never had the courage to ask him, well, can't I work in your lab? <laughs> 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 I still, I don't know. But I think, I know that he thought he was putting me in the, a great situation, and it was. And the most important aspect of that situation actually was the graduate student who took me under her wing and gave me advice about absolutely everything. So I joined the scientific community. I participated in lab meetings, in journal clubs. I ended up teaching. I ended up actually becoming a graduate student for the last semester. So my parents didn't have to pay tuition. Boy, they loved that aspect of it. So those two aspects of you can really do a lot of intellectual merit in a large conventional class from David Sonneborn. That was lesson mm -hmm. number one. And graduate students of the likes of Florence Hoffman, who's a decorated professor at the University of Southern California today. She was the graduate she student. She was the graduate student. That relationship can transform an undergraduate experience. And that's very scalable at a research university and it was like that, ours. And it was that experience that which you vividly recall. Exactly. And the transformative experience of, of a professor. Exactly. Of a single professor who introduced that world to you. Exactly. That, that's a wonderful Motivating story. so much of involvement of graduate students and scalable approaches. Those things were really, really right. important right from the beginning. So how did this, how did you begin to develop these ideas at Carolina? So there are two things that we put into place that I think are e extremely important. Um, the first is a course called Modes of Inquiry, in which faculty come in a forum that's meaningful to students and to faculty and simply tell their stories. So we select three from arts and, sci arts and humanities, three from social sciences, three from natural sciences. Students go and interview the faculty prior and write brief biographies of them. And then they serve as hosts when the faculty come and tell their stories. So, as an example, Kevin Guskowitz mm -hmm. came to the class years ago and told the story of sitting on the sidelines for the Steelers and saying, this is not right. We need a way to measure what's going on inside those helmets to monitor what the, the forces here. That was the beginning of his big idea, and look what happened. I mean, right. you knew he was a genius. Right. And the students can sense that too. So, of course, included also 
student panels to give advice to their peers. And these are for very young students. Uh, it's certainly they're encouraged to do it early on. They can do it as seniors because right. then they have advice to give. So it's again, it's this mini community and intellectual experience which is so important. And then they can are encouraged to take develop their own research paths and, and to take learn how to take the next steps. So the second really important element is these research exposure courses. And these are courses in which there is a requirement for a fully realized research project. You might be thinking, wow. What faculty are going to sign up to teach a course like that? It sounds like a lot of work. So we said, well, if faculty are going to make this change to incorporate such a project, we need, they need support. And the form the support took was to collaborate with a graduate student to work just 30 hours with limited responsibilities in the class, just there mm -hmm. to coach the students, help them narrow their topics, find appropriate sources, learn how to construct an argument, learn how to convey their findings effectively. So again, a story. Did you study French in college by any chance? Um, I did, many people I'm a, do. A, no, I was German. German, all right. Well, maybe there's the comparable in, in German. But in French, you read Moliere. And then you need, you know, there's going to be this exam. And you know it's going to be really tedious because, first right. of all, it's going to be in French. And you're going to have to write in French. And right. then at the end of it, you get this three credits on your transcript. It's like, at the end of that class, I'm like, I am changing my major. I hate this. <laughs> I, am I am international relations. I'm going to become a molecular biology major. So fast forward to Carolina. What do our students get to do? Yes, they read Moliere. Of course, you would read Moliere in French lit. But then the graduate research consultant, the person who's directing the research projects in the class, guides them to our archives, where we happen to have a collection of pamphlets written by people protesting the monarchy of the day. Students choose a social issue that's of interest to them and develop a poster presentation comparing the literary and political treatments of this issue. This is amazing. Right. They're doing what scholars do. I mean, if I had had that, I, I might be a diplomat today, although <laughs> I would have been truly terrible at it. But in any case, um, that's a So that's what we call what a students, research exposure, exposure class. Course. And these courses have from a very simple beginnings, this very simple mechanism where the graduate student has limited responsibilities and funding at the TA rate. They're not allowed to grade. So they are there simply to advise the students and quite honestly hold them to a higher standard. It's like, no, Google isn't enough. You really need this as a nature of your source. So the effect is that faculty really trust what the students are going to be saying in this cla very precious class time that they're devoting to what these projects are because they know that they've been coached. The students respond to that trust and the faculty are hearing new ideas. Right. They weren't the ones. They don't know which pamphlets were chosen or right. what the arguments are going to be. And what do faculty do best? We, do, we respond to new ideas in the best right. way. And in the just truly when it all works beautifully, there can be moments where a student really sticks to their argument and the faculty member says, hmm, you know, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, talk about a boost to your confidence that yes, this is something that you can make a difference in. So, so, but the point is, this is enlivening not only for the students, but for the faculty exactly. as well. Exactly. It keeps them exactly. alive and interested in, in, instead of just regurgitating old material over and over and exactly. over again. Exactly, exactly. Right. And the graduate student, meanwhile, gets to see the inner workings of the professor's course, has a jump start in their own career. It's community. It's, right. again, it's what is, is so important at a university like ours. And yet there's still another level, of course, over this, beyond this, this mm -hmm. one, which is called? Uh, research intensive courses. Okay, now let's describe so that. So now one. this, over half of the course content is what students do. So this is the individual mentoring that faculty can provide. These are courses, psychology is particularly good at this. History is an amazing model for mm -hmm. it. So courses where really the focus of the entire class, or at least over half of the class is on what students have done so that they have a lot of time to develop a, a fully fledged research project. So you've got this hierarchy of courses. Mm -hmm. You've got these graduate, uh, these graduate research consultants, results, GRCs. Research, GRCs. <laughs> How many of those would there typically be in a in a in a year or a semester? So the courses have so we're about two hundred to three hundred classes, depending mm -hmm. on resources. 
Um, so over 27,000 students have That's actually amazing. received course credit for these because of all the reasons you just said. Yeah. It is benefit, it's satisfactory for everyone. It's really quite remarkable. And there are summer research opportunities that you've established as well? Summer research opportunities were really important. We can't scale them quite to the extent, or not nearly to the extent, because they are costly. The idea, though, was for students to really be able to immerse themselves and essentially test drive a career in a, in a lot of uh, cases. So that's become really important, too. Maybe this is an appropriate time to look at a short video that will illustrate what one of these student experiences looks, really looks like. Great. I decided to get into research because I wanted to know what was ahead of the textbook because it takes a few years for the scientific community to agree on facts and data that they look at and finally decide that this is good and solid enough to put in a textbook. But when you are in class and you read this textbook, you're actually just reading knowledge that's a few years behind. So I wanted to get on to the very edge of research and see what's actually happening now. I'm looking at how a single cell, a zygote, becomes a full functioning organism. And in this process, there has to be a bunch of controls at every cell division. And I'm looking at a single cell division where one cell becomes two different types of cells. And we're just looking at how that's controlled, how you send information to one cell and send information to the other cell. And we can look at this by using new technologies in genomics, where we look at every single molecule. The big goal in research is, of course, to find something new, and that's what's most exciting part of it. It's to find something that no one else has ever known up until this point, even if it's this tiny question of how this one type of cell in one animal becomes two, that has all these implications that you're not even sure about yet, but you know it's important, and it's just the fact that no one else knows it at that time is very exciting. Lab time is really limited when you're in a class of 30 people, so undergraduate research lets you get into the lab, have a project that you kind of own yourself. It really allows you to focus in on one question that you, you're really interested in. Along the way, you meet all kinds of challenges, uh, whether it's you're too busy and you have a schedule that you have to work around your experiment, or that your experiment just doesn't work and you have to do some error analysis and see what you did wrong and how you can improve it. So it's this continuous process of trying something out and seeing what happens. And that's actually just what science is, right? doing something and seeing uh, the result of it and hopefully learning something new. So Pat, this was an example of a, of a student in science. Mm -hmm. I bet you've got examples of social science or arts and humanities. Absolutely. and so. The first one I want to describe is a student who was a psychology major who knew that she wanted to become a child psychologist. And she worked really hard on her surf proposal. And these are highly competitive, which is an aspect I'm not so comfortable with. I hate telling someone no at that, that stage in their lives. But in any case, she received one. And I heard her story because <coughs> I always applied for funding from the Carolina Parents Council. And mm -hmm. part of the application process was going and talking to the parents. And I loved doing this. It really kept me in touch with things that were important. And I always invited a student to, to, to come with me. So this student talked about a hair. She won the surf, and she's so excited. And after the first day, she knew she hated it. Hmm? She hated it because she realized she didn't want to study children at all. She wanted to comfort them and play with them and help them and nurture them and do all these things. She had not really understood what a career as a child psychologist would right, involve. Right. And so she, being who she was, carried out her obligations, finished her fellowship, and immediately changed her major to environmental sciences, where she did more research and Good was for really happy. So it was helpful, enormously helpful. Enormously helpful to, as I said before, test drive a career and right. make 
the decision, as I did, oh, this really isn't for me. I, I really, well, I still have time at a fabulous campus like ours with breadth in all so many areas, depth in so many areas. This, this is a, an incredibly important outcome. And so we really reassure students who receive the SERPs. You know, if you, if you change your mind about things, that's a good outcome too. So, uh, that, and the yeah, program is structured absolutely. that way. A second one, since we're both musicians, of course I have to tell a music story. So there were uh, two students, one played horn, one played clarinet, mm -hmm. and they applied jointly for a surf. So we, of course, love joint applications because we can stretch the resources further. And they decided that actually the literature for their instruments was incomplete. They had played everything that they thought was interesting. And so their proposal Especially was those two com that combination, that of, combination clarinet of clarinet, horn, and piano. I'm right. sorry, I should have explained. So, so their proposal was to really dig into, contact people, composers all over the world, and assemble a database online with annotations as to how difficult the piece was, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And then they ended up performing, giving a world premiere of one of these pieces at a very prestigious um, conference, music conference in workshop in, in Europe. And they're married to each other today, so this has <laughs> another, another positive outcome. So, well, that's a great yes. example. Well, it, you should, it is impossible, I think, to overestimate the creative imagination of our students. They do amazing projects. It's incredible. The wonderful thing about all this is that, obviously, this, is, this continues now. This has, mm -hmm. been, this has been permanently transplanted into the organism of of Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, because of the of the important work that you did to institutionalize mm -hmm. this. This, mm -hmm. you you didn't just do this yourself, mm -hmm. but you built a structure. You built an organization, mm -hmm. and you had, I think it's fair to say, strong administrative support mm -hmm. from the college, especially, mm -hmm. and from the provost, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to really to make to to, and there was something in the culture that, I think of this university. I think that welcomed it as of well. Of course, of course. So Tapping into the deepest aspirations. But your point about infrastructure is so important and it's something we thought about all the time. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the serfs essentially create their own infrastructure because if you have, as we did, endowment support for serfs in particular areas, right. that means there has to be a mechanism to advertise, select the students, etc. But it wasn't and just quite remind enough. The what the, what oh, SURF stands for Summer Undergraduate okay. Research Fellowship. Okay, That's good. actually copied from Caltech. But anyway, they were happy that we copied it. It's great. And what else would you call it, right? It was, right. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, an important, um, so we had these elements, but it still was difficult for students to navigate. And an incredibly important aspect of infrastructure was creating the Carolina Research Scholars Program mm -hmm. at the request of the then student body president, Eve Carson. Right. And what this is was a way for students to understand how the pieces fit together. So that, and the way they fit together is they earn a certain number of credits, they carry out a research project that's of enough substance that it can be presented at the campus symposium mm -hmm. to celebrate undergraduate research mm -hmm. or at a professional meeting. We ha have funds to send students to meetings of professional societies in their area if they're presenting something. And, and so this is a way for students to say, oh, I can see step by step I do all those things and then I get a designation on my transcript saying I'm a Carolina Research Scholar. And I can earn that at any time as a sophomore or junior. So that's really advantageous to me as I'm applying for internships, fellowships, et cetera. So those are things you might not think of as infrastructure, but I think right. they're really important. Num of course, numbering systems, et cetera. So things that people might think of more in terms of infrastructure is space. So when I started off, I had, granted, a beautiful room but it was an empty room in the lovely Gray Memorial. My office overlooks the Rose Garden. It's mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. And now there are three adjoining rooms there, two of which overlook the Rose Garden and space in the basement. Right. And, so, and people, and that's an important part of infrastructure too. So I was so thrilled that Krista Pereira became the Associate Dean and Director of the Office for Undergraduate Research after I retired. She is a designated professor from public policy. She won the Educator Graham Award last year. I mean, right, to right. someone of her stature to take this over is fantastic. Donna Bickford is the uh, associate director. She's an adjunct in English and writes like the wind and has gifts mm -hmm. in social media that have just furthered so many things. Monica Richard is the campus's most gifted program administrator. She made our small group have so much more influence, so much greater than the sum of our parts. She's really fantastic. 
And we had, were able to hire really dedicated graduate assistants and undergraduate work study students. And really important to me was a program we put into place called the Ambassadors Program, in which we provided leadership development, leadership training to students so that they could be effective ambassadors for the program. And we really, really wanted and always worried that the program would eventually come to not reflect the fabulous diversity of our student body. Mm -hmm. That students would think, oh, research, that sounds hard. That sounds like for someone much better prepared than I am. We wanted first generation students. We wanted covenant scholars. We wanted students of color. We wanted students returning as adults. We wanted all of that rich diversity to be contributors to this intellectual climate. And so ambassadors gave us a way to do that. So we provide develop, leadership development, as I said, and also some resources and put them in charge of what do you think would be effective? And of course, they come up with things we would never have thought of. We need a meet and greet on this day, and here's what's going to happen. And okay, right. fine. I mean, it's just, but it, it has been really important. Other things put into place, their term professorships. Uh, so these are professorships in research and undergraduate mm -hmm. education, again, spread across the disciplines. There's symposia, so the some campus symposium right. I mentioned. And also, we, uh, in 2001, took students to the North Carolina General Assembly from four of the system schools with the uh, organizational help from general administration. And it was transformative. Campuses across the system heard about it, said, hey, we want to be a part of this. There's now a consortium on undergraduate research for the system. And they also arrange a, a, a symposium for the state. And the ACC, our right, Atlantic right. Coast Conference, got into it the game. Kind of they a have a symposium. And, exactly. And so all of these ways. And of course, the greatest thing is when someone else is doing something that supports your programs, and you're not responsible for right. all the work that goes into it. So that's examples of infrastructure that so, have been really, really important. In, in many ways, you are an example of the classic entrepreneur. You, Thank you. you had an idea. <laughs> Uh, you were you were bold with it. You 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 had the courage to try something that really no one else had done. Mm -hmm. You have and so you created this startup. You had you launched it, and you went <clears throat> you went through all the phases of entrepreneurship to the point that that you now have, and, and frankly you have transformed the undergraduate experience in this campus. You and your your colleagues. I mean I just uh, salute you for what you did. Oh, thank you. And because it it is making and has made a huge difference. And I I love the. The fact that Eve Carson was involved, I Isn't mean, that so, amazing? she was she was an amazing person. But this the idea of, invo and she was, uh, as you know, so big into student engagement. Exactly. So this so this undergraduate research is is an example of not just research but engagement of our students in the whole life and fabric of the campus. Exactly, breaking down those firewalls. That's what. Yeah, it has its now. There were roots back in. You came in the early seventies, right? Late seventies. Late seventies, yeah. and but in the nineties, in the nineties, when Michael Hooker was chancellor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there was uh, Dick Richardson. I think mm -hmm. was the provost. Exactly. Uh, there was this task force uh, for the uh, intellectual climate, mm -hmm. and, and if I'm not mistaken, that's where you began to to get to really get your your hands I into the fabric of. of of making change happen. We just, just and so there are some important people that we need to mention That's, who are yeah. no. help, who are your your <laughs> exactly your, your com complicitors, your co-conspirators. Exactly. So the story starts just a couple years before then yeah. in laying the grassroots groundwork, which I thought was really important. So we left off where I'm doing these things in my classes, but of course I've become curious. Is anyone else doing this? I mean, am I the only one? Surely not. And Marshall Edgel, uh -huh. uh, it turned out we had very similar interests, and we just decided to see what we could do as individual faculty, first to find out how widespread was inquiry-based education. And the way we did it was, this is back in the day when things come in the mail, you know, so you had a mailbox and pieces of paper right, were in there right. and there was no email or anything. So we got some limited funding f to be able to send out a letter of invitation across to every faculty member on campus asking a simple question. Are, are you able to bring your research expertise into your classes? Would you be willing to come and have lunch with us and talk about that and so we can know what's going on and, and maybe make this something that's much more visible so that students can sign up for courses knowing what they're going to be doing in the class? Wouldn't this be a, a really benefit? 
And so that simple question led to two years of conversations. Mm -hmm. It was so rich and so important for faculty to, to, to be able to hear, to, to offer suggestions and to hear what others were doing and adopt and tweak those um, to improve what they were doing. So kind of a lesson learned from that is it's really important to know how to structure a meeting. Right. Uh, faculty, believe it or not, really don't appreciate being brought into a room and lectured to. <laughs> told surprise. What to, surprise, surprise. Uh, because they have so much to offer. And right. so it's pretty easy to, to structure things in that way. And then, yes, the story that you uh, started with, which is this intellectual climate task force. Marshall was the head, and I was um, a member. And oh, we were just ready to take this inquiry track program, we called it at that point, campus-wide. We had the grassroots support. We ha now had this task force. This was going to be the And thing. as I recall from, from the reading I did before I came, Michael Hooker himself was pretty critical of the quality of the undergraduate experience when he... He, he was, was, indeed. And, this, and this, rightfully so, apparently. And rightfully so. <laughs> I mean, the recommendations in that report are amazing. I mean, yeah. they really did so much. But on this committee, we were sort of carrying the day with inquiry track, but there was this, well, I saw as a competing idea, mm -hmm. an office for undergraduate research. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> another office. <laughs> another office, more bureaucracy. That could only reach such a limited number of students, as opposed to this inquiry track. It could reach everyone. It could really transform the intellectual climate. And if we put both of those in, administrators are going to focus on this office thing because that's the easy thing to do <laughs> as an administrator. You can understand where sure. that would go. Yeah, this yeah. grassroots stuff just seems a little on the messier side. So I, you know, wasn't quite you persuasive so enough. <laughs> and so both things ended up in the report. And so that was all fine. And so well, however much time it took, uh, the report is now, as you say, Dick Richardson loved it and just went through in terms of implementation. And he was a real genius, I think. Mm -hmm. And and one day I go to my mailbox and there's this packet of stuff from someone who I didn't know named Bernadette Gray Little. No. And she had, was then appointed as the first senior associate dean for undergraduate education. And she was responsible for implementing the, some of these recommendations. And sure enough, there was this creation of the Office for Undergraduate Research. And I threw it in the trash can. <laughs> went into my lab for much more right. important things, whatever it was right. I had to do that day, and uh, came back in. I always ate lunch, or almost always ate lunch, just at my desk. Happened to look down as I'm eating my yogurt, and oh my gosh, there, well, come on. I mean, it had landed on the top of the pile of okay. trash, and so okay. I pull it out. I mean, surely, I asked myself, I mean, you've got to be curious enough. Think of all the hours you spent on that committee. I mean, you might as well know what they decided to do with it. So I turned to the relevant part of Office for Undergraduate Research, and there was the list of responsibilities for the new director, including supporting faculty in adopting inquiry-based pedagogies. Yeah. I'm like, I've actually had an influence on this campus. This is <laughs> incredible. I've got to meet this person and find out that was a you know request. Are they to, really? Are they serious? Yeah. Well, but what would it be like? And right. was this something I might want to want to do? But yes, are they serious or did they just? That's a good. Did that occur to me? Of course, I knew they had to be serious. Right. The words are here on the page. So, yes, I uh, 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 sent in my letter of interest and was interviewed and was appointed to the position. And so that, that was really and that quite was a so, terrific so, so that experience. Was, so I'm glad you mentioned Bernadette Gray Little because yeah. she was so important in, the, in, the, in the, that history of this university, all to be right. being provost before we lost her to right. Francis as the chancellor. An amazing, amazing person. Indeed. I never told her, but I would have gladly paid for the opportunity <laughs> to work but with I, her, although I did welcome the extra support that I got. But, but, I, but I disagree with you one thing. Administrators sometimes send out, they're not always serious. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so I think just the, Good to know. finding out that Bernadette really was committed yes. to this. Yes. And, and apparently Risa Palm, who was the yes. dean, was mm -hmm. as well. Very much so. Very and, much so. And so you got the support you needed. Yes. But I had to do a lot. Yeah. And I think the lesson learned is you can adopt, you have to make it obvious. If you want someone to change, even a tiny change, it has to be immediately obvious to them what the benefit is. And then there could be a long-term, sort of more hypothetical benefit. So I kind of adopted, as I was going around trying to get more allies and you know, build this up, a, a kind of a mantra of ask both 
what the Office for Undergraduate Research can do for you and what you can do for right, where you are. And right. finding people where these initial efforts were really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Small departments, for example, who wanted to increase their majors. There were lots of strategies. that you, Scholarships and student aid, they were fantastic early allies. So finding finding those early allies and then right. how what you're doing can benefit them is, I think, a really important thing to do. So, uh, I always ask people on this on this series what you might have done differently, or what are the lessons learned from this experience. So there are a couple more things that I think I, can I talk about to, sure. in terms of putting into place. And so, so with all of this, um, there then comes the next goal of aiming as high as I possibly could, mm -hmm. which was to change the culture. And the reason I really wanted to tell this story is because this involves you. So this was the yeah, <laughs> this was the uh, reaccreditation in which there was a quality enhancement right, plan, and right. undergraduate research was a key part of that. And I was in charge of the committee now, and, and it was an amazing experience where we, in only three meetings, put together a structure and a plan, which, as you have said earlier, really has transformed the campus. And I, I, I think that that's a really important thing. There's also an important lesson in terms of fundraising. I think you... Um, you really need to be prepared to write a lot of grants if you take a position yeah, like this. Yeah, I was going to ask you specifically <laughs> about it because you mentioned a lot of you mentioned resources earlier on mm -hmm. in, in all these these uh, the study abroad and the mm -hmm. the, the, the the term distinguished professors mm -hmm. in the college. Mm -hmm. That all implies private money or, exactly. or either or grants. You know, so, right. what, so of course the so first the financial underpinning of that makes this work. Obviously, it takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of resources. So. Your first success is always your favorite, right? So the Smallwood Foundation, yeah. uh, it wasn't a large grant, but they were so wonderful and never was able to turn them into Bigwood, but in, anyway, mm -hmm. they were just huge for us. Um, National Science Foundation, the Kaufman Foundation, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. It, it was a, a, really, I love writing grants, but I think the lesson learned is you do need to always be aware of what are the underpinnings that are going to ensure that this is going to continue once you're no longer the right. person putting in all these energies. And getting back to the question that you just asked, are there things I might have done differently? Mm -hmm. And I think it's in this area. Because when I started, it just was clear to me that if I was going to put energy into this, that I would end up with something that would surely be worth a $20 million endowment from the campus. Yeah, yeah. And I think I did that. I think what's in place now is definitely deserving mm -hmm. of endowment support at that level, and we're not anywhere close to that. And so, is there something I could have done differently? I mean, of the list of possibilities, yeah. this yeah. is so obvious. Why hasn't this happened? Certainly among on that list is, well, uh, maybe there was a path not taken that I didn't realize mm -hmm. at the time that could have led to success um, in this area. Um, I won't know I'm retired. <laughs> but that, okay, but that leads me to ask the, the, the next question, which is uh, looking ahead, mm -hmm. and look, especially looking forward to a new capital campaign mm -hmm. for the university. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think the support is, I mean, it sounds like to me that this, is, this program is ripe for individual, not only foundation support and grant support, but for donor support from alumni who see the value of what's been, what's been created here to enrich the, the the undergraduate experience at Carolina. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, I did want to say that your first speech, when you first were introduced to the campus as chancellor, when you said we can become a leading university, mm -hmm. really was deeply meaningful to me. I said, yeah, I, I can do that. And I think we are. We right now, Carolina is leading the country in this approach to scalable undergraduate research experiences. Right. No one else is anywhere close. So on this idea of what could Office for Undergraduate Research contribute to the capital campaign and what could the capital campaign contribute to them, we have these transformative stories. Because quite honestly, a lot of our most fervent supporters and alumni were students at a time when the firewalls were pretty much in place. Right, and, right. and they, you know, they, they might not completely understand the necessity of all this, but but I'm quite certain that Office for Undergraduate Research could really help build this case. And I am absolutely convinced that we are deserving of support at this level. And it would help solidify our position as the leaders and encourage more followers so that these experiences could be 
made available to undergraduates this could become the norm of undergraduate education, which is so important with all of the problems that our society faces. Well, I, my hope is that, that because of the rich experiences that your program, I won't say you personally, because I know that it's a, yeah. now it's a whole army of faculty that are committed to this idea. Exactly. Um, uh, but, but the, and the, the two things have happened, I, I think, which, and I think we have, in fact, become a leading university in large part because of, of this whole movement. Uh, you've enriched the lives of all the faculty who've had these experiences because, and, and that allows us to not only recruit but retain mm -hmm. great faculty mm -hmm. who love doing research and who love connecting their research to their teaching, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. keeps them alive mm -hmm. day after day mm -hmm. and week after week and semester after semester. But it also has greatly enriched our ability to attract the very best students to this mm -hmm. campus exactly. because they're excited by this. Exactly. And so, we're, and so I, I love this idea that we are really leading the nation in, in, in this effort. And so I think uh, the prospect of taking this story to alumni who love this place uh, and who want to support it is, is, is one of the best stories we have to tell. And, and we have Wonderful. you to thank for this incredible uh, transformation. This is a good to great story, and, and, <laughs> and I just thank you for, 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 for what you've done. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.